How are you all feeling? It's been a long day. I think probably sometimes a little bit depressing and sometimes a little bit hopeful. Um, so I'm here to do a bit of everything for you because it's going to be a little bit depressing and hopefully a lot hopeful. So I just want to talk about what we're here to do. It's all about the climate summit, but is it all about global heating? Pretty much we all have seen this image, I'm sure, a number of times today. But what's been interesting is we've been trying to keep within 1.5 degrees centigrade for quite some time. And we're a little bit like uh, kids who just won't, let's see if it'll work, just won't listen to their mum and dad. And unfortunately, over time, we're seeing now we're at a very critical level. So I just need to confess I don't work with agriculture, I work with the ocean. So I'm bringing an outsider's view to the issues that are facing agriculture and bringing my knowledge to it. And what I've learned has been really interesting. So I was shocked to find out that at least a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions come from food production. That's kind of a lot. And I've learned a lot more about it, is that of course we are um, as we start feeding ourselves and trying to be more efficient and effective, we're increasing um, the land that we've used for agriculture, we're increasing our livestock, and it's just getting more and more. The worst part is that we have to encroach into other land, and then we're eating into the habitat of the rest of biodiversity that was living there. This is on land. Let's take this now, oh sorry, that's leading to deforestation. But then now, I just want to talk about the ocean, which I do know a lot about. And unfortunately, we are extracting from the ocean literally nearly 95% um, of, of our fish stocks. And I'm gonna just put this in a context to you, which I find very interesting. We extract from the ocean each year half the weight of the human population in fish, and we discard 40% of it before we even land it. Kind of not very, we're not managing this very well. All of this lads up to the bad news. Our carbon footprint is really big in how we eat, and that is, um, entails deforestation. These are probably things that we all know, but I think it's important to go back to the big picture land clearing, pesticides, herbicides, livestock expansion, and agricultural runoff. They're not just one after the other, they actually all converge to make far worse situations. The same, is, the same happens in the ocean with industrial fishing, bottom trawling, open pen aquaculture, fish farming, shrimp, farming, krill farming, and then, to boot, we throw in marine and chemical um, plastic pollution. Now, just out of interest, I just wanted to mention this to you because I thought this was quite fun. Um, for those of you who have come here by train, that's really good and I applaud you, but if you don't eat bottom trawled fish, you can spare the same amount of emissions as, as global aviation, but I'd rather you did both. Don't think I'm letting you off, so that's not happening. In my job, I have to make connections because it's very easy to worry about the fish, it's very easy to worry about these things, but we have to think about how our impact affects other people. And this is krill. It's happening right now. So, do you all know what krill is? It's this tiny little prawn-like uh, creature that lives usually in ice-cold water, usually in the Antarctic. And we're fishing it for our omega-3 vitamin supplements, color for salmon farming, and for fertilizer. Wow. The problem for me is I don't really give a damn about that. I care about what lives, the marine ecosystem that lives there. And we're taking away from whales, from seals, and from penguins. And just to let you know that a few years ago, the Adelie penguin, which relies on krill, and was the subject of a movie called Happy Feet, had a colony collapse precisely because they couldn't get to krill in time. 
The other thing about krill is they're a huge carbon sink. Um, they molt, and that molting falls into the water and sequesters carbon. Um, so does uh, their poop. So basically, the more we remove krill, and this is just one example, but take that by fishing, by extraction. Anyway, we're, we're removing carbon from the ocean when in fact we should be conserving it. I want to make this positive. So for every single piece of bad news, I'm going to try and give you some things that you can all go away and try and do. So easy here, eat more plant-based, eat less meat, less dairy, less fish. Um, and also look for vitamin gel, uh, um, uh, vegan gel caps. I found them and, and they're quite easy to find and you can also get plant-based omega. Easy things and also whilst we're at it, let's look at our investments, look at where we're putting our money in these areas as well. Um, why is this happening? Easy. We have to produce, 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 overproduce because we're overconsuming, and much of that is down to subsidies. Um, we are subsidizing agriculture today at 600 billion uh, uh, annually. Fishing is uh, 32 billion. It's kind of we're incentivizing the wrong actions. And this is where I want to go to the bigger picture, and this is something that I like to do. We're constantly focusing on carbon. We're constantly focusing on reducing it. But there are some other issues that are also equally important, and we need to be very clear that they are equally important. If we just go ahead on carbon and don't do anything about anything else, then we're not solving the problem. We solve for X, and we really mess up A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So the next big part of the poly crisis is the biodiversity loss, and it's not looking good. We are literally fading to gray. The IUCN endangered red list uh, of species um, in the last 15 years has doubled. And at the same time, in the last 50 years, we've lost 70% of our biodiversity. You know, biodiversity is important for nature. It's important for our whole survival. It's important for the way we think. It's important for our society. We need to really think about this because this is one of the reasons why we do what we do. How has this come about? Well, sadly, 96% of all biomass is us and livestock. 70% of all birds are poultry. And that leaves us with 4% for everything else. It's, it's wrong, and I'm sure that we all feel that. But what can you do? Um, definitely look at your, where your money's going. Stop and use your voice, use your pocket, use anything you can, your contacts, to stop subsidies to oil, gas, and coal. Also, to intensive agriculture, because it's destroying the land. We may get production in short term, but long term we're losing a lot. Unsustainable fishing, um, soil degradation, and of course, petrochemical fertilizers. The other part of this issue is health. And this was fascinating for me, because despite the fact that we produce um, about 5,730 uh, 5, um, kcal per person on the planet, we actually only need a quarter of that. But what happens? One third of it goes to feeding livestock. A lot of it goes to wastage on the way. We've ended up with a population, this is 7 billion, we are already nearly 8 billion, but look at it, starving. We still have starving people, despite the fact that we produce more than we need. We still have obese people, which is an unhealthy diet. We have micronutrient deficiencies and we have overweight people. How come we are producing so hard, so fast, so strong, and we're still not getting it right? I'm not going to go into this because I'm sure we've all talked about it, but it is the impact of uh, pesticides, which not only are there, or, or fertilizers, to, to basically try and speed up this process. The problem is by forcing the issue, we have collateral damage. Insects die, birds that feed on them die, prey that feeds on birds die, and that's why we are at biodiversity loss. But the other thing I want to talk about, which some of you may have heard of, but I think many of you may not, and it's funny, I saw this image used earlier today. So, plastic, oh my God, it's everywhere. And you can sit there and go, oh, what a pain it is. Oh, I don't know, I recycle, I do this. But it's more insidious than that. 
Plastics are made of fossil fuels, and they contain petrochemicals that are... Um, sorry, my voice. Um, that basically um, are used to make a plastic hard, soft, flexible. But we're exposed to those chemicals on a daily basis. And we get them through dermal contact, ingestion, inhalation. The thing about it is that normally when we have a dose, a dose makes the poison. What we've learned about is that you are exposed on a constant level to microdosing. And these chemicals mimic our hormones. And the way it works is that when I was pregnant, those hormones come into play. When my child is born and develops to puberty, those hormones come into play. When it is uh, throughout life, we have specific key moments. What this is doing is saying it's all the time. And that is messing with our system. So you may have heard of them, bisphenols, which are BPA, BPS, BPF. You may have heard of phthalates and PFAS. Well, guess what? They're in all our food. But the important thing to know is that this kind of, um, of exposure adds up to serious and long-term health damage, which people are not talking about. So it leads to cancers, it leads to infertility, it leads to obesity, it leads to depression, um, and it leads to infertility. And that's happening soon. This was a report done by someone I know who set out to disprove a different, um, a different uh, uh, report, and she ended up more alarmed than anything. Originally, her report was sperm decline in, in Western countries due to go to statistical zero in 2045. Actually, no, it's going to be um, in, uh, um, all countries. So what can we do? Eat organic, it's serious. Eat less seafood where you can. Avoid single-use plastic. Don't heat food, uh, food in plastic. Never heat food in plastic. Don't store food in plastic long-term. So where are we today? This is an important image for me because it shows that um, the planet is about 70% water. And the one impact, I heard people talking today about global warming, the heating, and everything. But I just need to let you know that we subsidize fossil fuels to the tune of 7 trillion annually. And that enables greenhouse gas emissions. And we think most of that heat energy goes into the atmosphere. Wrong. Up to now, 90% of our excess energy has been stored in the ocean from human-generated activities. And that absorbed heat has bought us time. We are now at a current global surface of 15 degrees centigrade. Without the ocean, we would be at 50 degrees centigrade. And the most important thing is that this year, we've, received the, we've reached the highest temperatures ever recorded. And that is now the equivalent of seven Hiroshima bombs exploding in the ocean per second. So basically, we've got to remember the ocean is linked to the atmosphere, is linked to climate change, and that everything that we're doing for putting greenhouse gas emissions in, we're starting to hurt the one engine that has been protecting us all this time. So, We've seen this one before, you, and I know it's the wedding cake, and I know that there was talk about it, but what we need to, be un to understand is anything that we try to do does not work if we can't breathe air, drink water, have a clear, clean ocean, and actually have healthy soil. Why is this happening? Because the way that society has developed is that it's very egocentric, and we need to realize that we have to work more holistically. We are connected to all things in one way or another. Bear that in mind because everything we do, everything I do here is affecting someone on the other side of the ocean with sea level rise, with plastic pollution and more. So what can I do? In the words of David Attenborough, do less of the bad things and more of the good. So here are some three examples where things are working very well. Um, Agroecology is a really important um, system. It is, it's slower, and it's not just a farming practice, but a philosophy. So whilst our industrial agriculture focuses on short-term games, this is at the expense of long-term sustainability, agroecology is putting the ecosystem at the center. So we have here um, the amount of land that we would use 
for vegetables as opposed to land for meat. We have to sort of think of how much are we squeezing into everything when we could actually be a little bit more restrained, but without being limited. So this case study took place in India a few years ago, Andhra Pradesh. It was a woman-led community managed in natural farming. This woman here um, was a low-caste woman, and she's now, due to being um, enabled to do this regenerative agriculture, she's now become a master farmer. So the thing is that we're bringing social mobility, we talked about that before, about the power of women, that basically um, women, um, I think the statistic is a quarter of all lands under five acres are run by women. We need to promote that because that's where much of our food is coming from. In this case, um, she shows a rice crop which with withstood cyclone damage. On one side it was chemically treated and the other one was not. And um, right now, as a result of its success, 12% of a six million farmers are using this methodology. I'm going to go to the next slide. Don't be alarmed, because there's a lot in it. Bottom line, what I wanted to say is the benefits are not only environmental and economic, they bring solid social, um, solid health impacts. In fact, what we discovered is that because they didn't have to spend money on petrochemical fertilizers, they actually saved money. So there is these balances. We're actually pro proving the economics of environmental biodiversity. The marine system is also really important. And I want to show you this image. Oh, uh, prevent, yeah, first of all, we'd have to, these are the things we must do. Prevent marine pollution, stop. These are normal. I mean, this is clear. I don't think I need to spell these out. But the destructive fishery subsidies are probably the worst, and protecting, protecting the ocean is the best. And here's an example where this has happened. So you can see that little square there. Actually, it's a huge square. is a marine protected area. And this was proved also during COVID, where fisheries couldn't fish. If you leave the ocean alone for a short time, it becomes abundant. And so why are there all those white bits concentrating around the edge? Because there's more fish. So if you leave it alone for a bit, you will reap rewards long term. We need to reduce our chemical and plastic exposure. I mean, really? This is why I am driven to do what I do, and it's what I spoke about earlier, about the endocrine disrupting chemicals. It's tr think about it, children's toys, fragrances, food packaging, um, receipts. We need to be aware of these things so that you know what to look out for, to A, lobby to change it, remove, that's one of the things we're doing, is aiming to remove all of these harmful chemicals, but it's very important. The dots. We're not gonna get further if we are only focusing on that little vision there. We've got to understand that there's a whole area where indigenous power and racial justice is important to be included, where nature-based solutions play an equal part, and where ecocide law, for example, can help litigation to protect our planet. I think at the end, I've given you enough to ponder and think about food for thought, literally, and I'd like to say, Thank you.